Today is the 14th Sunday after Pentecost. The Mass today, however, is from the Feast of St. Joachim with a commemoration and proper last gospel of the Sunday. Birds of the air, for they neither sow nor do they reap, nor gather into barns, and your heavenly Father feedeth them. From last week's gospel, there is no one found to return and give glory to God but this stranger. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The St. Ignatius of Loyola, the great founder of the Jesuits, the, are also known as the soldier saint, when he converted, he always desired one thing, and that was to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Lands, there where he could walk in the footsteps of our Lord, see the place where the infant Savior was born, and see the place where he carried his cross and then was crucified and died for us. That was his one desire. And soon enough, he got to make this trip. And on his return trip back home to Italy, he had to pass through a land, a country called Cyprus. And there he would await a, a ship to Italy. And there were three boats there at port, three ships. And the first one was owned by some Turks. And they, of course, because they were infidels and did not like Christians, they would not accept him on their ship. And the second ship was owned by some men of Venice. And this ship was a very large one, very comfortable. And in the eyes of all men, it was very supposed to be very sturdy. And so some of the passengers on board that ship begged the captain to let St. Ignatius on board because of his great holiness. And so the captain asked St. Ignatius if he had any money. And he did not. He told him that. And the captain said that he could not accept anyone free of charge. And he said, besides, if, you, if this man is a saint, he can do just as St. Peter, and he doesn't need my ship. He can walk on water to where he needs to go. And so he would not accept him either. And so there was this third ship. It was scarcely a ship at all. It was so sea-worn and rickety and, and so tiny that it would scarcely make such a long journey. But he was forced to take this ship to Italy. And so before he boarded this ship, he knelt down and asked God to protect him on his long journey. And then he boarded the ship with complete confidence that God would take care of him, that he would provide for him. And soon enough, they all three ships left. And soon after they were out in the sea, a big tempest arose. The waves were so big they threatened at every moment to engulf each of the ships to, to drown them. And indeed, after some time, the Turkish, Turkish ship was sunk and it went to the bottom of the ocean and all of the men on board died. And then shortly after that, the second ship belonging to the men of Venice, the man who had refused to take Ignatius, that too was thrown up against a sandbank and then it was that all on board that ship too were killed. And the only one that made it was this small ship that in the eyes of men was not even supposed to make it to the other side. And from this we can learn a little lesson, a little proof of the truth of today's gospel. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be given unto you. You see, St. Ignatius was a very holy man. That was his one desire, was to seek the kingdom of God. And our Lord protected him. The Holy Cure of ours used to say that God commands us to pray, not to worry. That is, no matter what, no matter how discouraging things get, no matter how desperate things seem to be, trust in providence. We should do everything that we can do to make things go well, but then rely on God to bring it to fruition. Trust in divine providence no matter how desperate things get. That was his one piece of advice that he liked to give. So what is divine providence exactly? It is the loving care by which Almighty God orders every single thing that happens in this world. That is what it is. Everything which has ever happened, be it a hundred years ago, be it two thousand years ago, be it something which will happen a thousand years from now if the world lasts that long. Be they good, bad, or indifferent events, 
whether in the spiritual order or the temporal order. Everything that happens is disposed by God in His infinite wisdom. And we should always remember that. Everything that happens, happens because God has willed it or He has permitted it. So each thing that happens, from the, the greatest things down to the tiniest details of our life, are ordered by divine providence. And so, for example, it was ordered by divine providence that Adam and Eve would commit their sin. That was part of divine providence. And God foresaw that from all eternity. He knew that before He created man, that man would offend Him. But He permitted it and draw, drew a greater good from this from this event. And that was the incarnation and then the death of our Lord which proved the love of Christ for man. That was the greater good which came from that. Then you see how providential it was, the, the flood in the times of Noah, how providential that was. The, the earth was filled with sinners and God did not like that, of course. He became very displeased. And so he destroyed the sinners. And who survived that flood but those who were seeking first the kingdom of God? Noah and his, father, his family. And they survived it. So God does not care so much about quantity, numbers, but he cares about quality. He cares about how fervent a person is. Now, from these events and all other events which took place in the past, we can easily, because of our hindsight, we can see how providential these actions are. But the one thing that's difficult for man here and now is to see how providential everything is that happens in your own life at the present moment. How providential each of these events really is. We forget that when things are contrary to our will and that we forget that when they're contrary to our will, that God has planned them from all eternity. We forget that God sees all of these things. We forget that nothing escapes His all-seeing eye. We forget that nothing escapes His infinite knowledge. We forget that. So much so that if, if a single hair from our head were to fall, that does not happen except by the divine permission. Or if a single blade of grass were to wither up and die. God knows that. As insignificant a thing as that is, God knows it. And from all eternity. And it only happens by divine permission. And so whatever happens in our life, it happens by divine providence. And so to bring this to a practical point of your life, we should remember that from all eternity, God has foreseen these very times in which we live. The times of Vatican II, the times when so many men would forsake His church. When, as St. Paul says, so many men would turn their ears from the truth and listen to fables. They would accept these fables. That there would be a time when people would no longer even believe in the first principles of reason. Or that there would come a time when anti-popes would rule, would take over the chair of Peter. God foresaw that from all eternity. He, he foresaw it. And He permitted this great evil, as evil as it is, He permitted it. But there is some greater good which eventually will come from this event. And we should not think that when God permits this or any other evil, that He is cruel. Many people in the world look at God and accuse Him of cruelty or injustice. But that is not the case. The people who do that are very ignorant and very foolish. They are very unwise. They either do not believe in divine providence or they do not trust in divine providence. It is always one of the two. From all eternity, we must remember, God has permitted this event. Now, our Lord tells us in the Sunday Gospel of today that He takes care of the birds of the air and He provides for them. When a bird migrates south for the winter, He doesn't book a hotel room. He doesn't make a reservation at a restaurant somewhere. But God provides. God provides the shelter and the food. He always provides. And He tells us that we are more valuable than they are. 
We have immortal souls that must be saved. And so He will take care of us. And then at the end of the Gospel He says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His justice, and everything else will follow. Everything else will fall into place. So, my dear faithful, from all eternity, God has planned this event. From all eternity, God has planned to put you in this time of the church rather than another, for some reason or other. And you see that nonetheless, God has provided for you. He has provided for each one of us here today. We have done nothing. Just like those birds who go migrating south, they do nothing and God provides. We have not merited to belong to this church. We have not merited to receive these sacraments or this faith. But God has provided in His loving providence. He has provided it all. Think of the millions of men out there who do not have the faith. They're, they're caught up in the Novus Ordo. They're caught up in Lutheranism or Hinduism or any of those other religions. You could have very easily been one of those. God did not owe it to you to bring you here. Think of all the men without the sacraments. Think of all the men without a priest to counsel them or a bishop to give them confirmation. You could have been one of them, but God has provided. And then, especially for you here at St. Hugh's, for 20 or so years, perhaps even more than that, you went with maybe a Mass here and a Mass there, but God, in His divine providence, has supplied you with a priest. The priest is only an instrument, but nonetheless, He has supplied it to you. He has supplied you the daily Mass, which you are witnessing here today. The opportunity for frequent confession. He has provided all of that. It is your spiritual food. There are so many traditional Catholics out there who don't get the opportunity of daily Mass. Don't even get the opportunity of confession. Maybe some are lost out there and don't even know the true Mass exists. But He has called you here and given you all of these graces, all of these blessings. Now, in last Sunday's Gospel, to conclude with, we saw how our Lord provided for the health of the ten lepers. And only one of those men returned to give thanks to God. And I'm afraid that many of us Catholics today are like the nine who were healed, who were given all of these blessings, and who went away ungrateful. They never thanked God. They never thought of offering a prayer of thanksgiving. But on the contrary, they complain. They complain when things go badly. They complain of the efforts that it takes to get to Mass on Sunday or to receive the sacraments properly. They complain. Rather than thanking God for those things, they complain. But I remind you, gratitude is a virtue. And oftentimes what happens when we are ungrateful for these gifts that we have been given, God will take them away from you. And so that is something to be careful of. If you are not thankful for the Mass and the sacraments as you ought to be, God may one day, as a just punishment for your ingratitude, take them away. It is something that you must do is to be thankful for them. Now our Lord tells us, to whom much has been given, much is expected. The Holy Eucharist, I remind you, means thanksgiving. In Greek it means thanksgiving. The Mass and the Holy Eucharist are the most precious things that we have on the face of this earth. Right there, they are. On this very altar, here at St. Hugh's. And it is sad to say that though many of you live 15, 20, 25 minutes away, at daily Mass, there's only three or four of you that come. Out of the 70, perhaps, people that come here, three or four at daily Mass to witness the death of Christ, to witness His passion, to witness the shedding of His blood. Three or four people. The best way to show gratitude is to use well the gifts that He has given. You must use these gifts well. You must use them well. They are blessings and they will get you to heaven. Don't use the excuse that you are too busy to assist at Mass. In most cases, that's not true. St. Thomas More, as busy as he was, found time every single day to assist at Mass. 
unless you have a job that you cannot get away from, you should make it a point, at least a couple times during the week, to get here to Mass, to receive the sacraments more frequently. It only, remember that if you seek the Kingdom of God first, then all of your other duties will fall into place. You will call down the blessing of God upon each and every one of your duties. So don't use the excuse that you just don't have time. Most of the time, it is because you don't know how to use to, to order your time. And that is most of the time the case. So the practical resolution for today, first of all, never worry excessively. Trust in divine providence that He will provide as long as we do our part. And secondly, see all of the graces that God has given you in His infinite wisdom and in His infinite goodness and thank Him for it. Thank Him often. But most importantly, by using these graces well each and every single day of your life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.